Morning, little family. Okay, so this is me smiling at you. But you see, I can't tell that you're smiling at me because you've got these jolly smiles. So you have to let your eyes tickle a bit. Or at least you're going to say, morning, Christopher, or something that I know. I'm welcome because I'm so glad to be in this place this morning. Do you know that next week is the day of Pentecost? It's a great and wonderful day. It's a day when we celebrate the birth of the church around the face of this earth. And a day when we celebrate the fact that God the Holy Spirit came in power into this world to enliven us and to send us out to uphold the name of Jesus. A great day. A wonderful day. I am um, passionately dedicated to the centrality of Jesus in all things. And there's a danger in that. The danger is that one can get so focused that one neglects God the Holy Spirit and God the Father. Yet all three constitute this wonderful, wonderful, mysterious, ununderstandable triunity of God. So today I want to connect Pentecost, the feast we'll be celebrating next week, with Jesus and with the Father. And I want to prepare our hearts for next week. I want to give you information and encouragement that will help you and me again to grasp just how important it is and what we should be expecting as we come into this time. Now, the day of Pentecost was one of three mandatory feasts on the Jewish calendar. That meant that every male over the age of 22, I think it was, had to, by Jewish law, present himself to Jerusalem, to the temple. So wherever they were in the countryside, they would stream up to Jerusalem for those three feasts. And the three feasts were Pentecost was one of them, Passover was another, and Tabernacles was the third. Now the Gospels, and particularly John's Gospel, describe in quite a lot of detail when Jesus attended Passover and mentions it, I think, four times. It also mentions Tabernacles. When Jesus came to Tabernacles, and what you read out earlier, that's actually when he came and celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. It gives us that information. But what about Pentecost? Why is there no mention of Pentecost in the Gospels? Why? Well, perhaps the Gospels are not as silent as we think on this. You see, Jesus must have celebrated Pentecost at least twice, if not three times during his adult ministry. It was a very important occasion, and as a Jewish male, he had to come to obey the law. And you'll find in John chapter 5, verse 1, it's recorded as follows. It says, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now, John mentioned tabernacles by name. He mentioned Passover four times by name. Why didn't he mention Pentecost? Could this be the day of Pentecost? Well, I think it was, and I'll explain why in a few moments. Now, most of that chapter, John chapter 5, tells the story of how Jesus came up and he went for a feast and he went to a pool called Bethesda. He went straight there. And this pool was a traditional place. It was also a bit of a pagan place, really, in many ways. And there were five colonnades there and this pool. And it, it seems that it was linked to some kind of a mineral pool because every now and then the water would bubble up and some of the ancient historians like Josephus record that the water sort of turned a, a, a sort of a reddish color in the middle when it, when it bubbled up. But it looks like it was chemicals coming up. And so the, the mystery came into being and the tradition came in that when the water was bubbling, it was because an angel had come and stirred the waters. And first one in would be healed. So they came in their hundreds every day. Nobody knew when the water was going to bubble. They came and they waited. And amongst them was one man who had been lame for 38 years. 38 years. Can you imagine? Being brought on a little reed mat every day by some faithful friend, maybe. Just lying there in the sun, baking, waiting. And then if the water started to bubble, he would try and get there, but he couldn't walk. So he's trying to get there on his elbows and his tummy, and he can't make it because somebody else is always in first. 38 years of waiting. And then came Jesus. He just came and walked 
like a spirit-guided, laser-guided missile. <laughs> he was led by the Spirit for sure. He came and just singled this man out. And he walked straight up to him. And he said, do you want to be healed? Poor guy. And you can imagine his confusion. So he looks at Jesus and he, he kind of says this. He says, but sir, when the water bubbles up, uh, I've got nobody to help me and I'm, I'm never in first. You know, it's almost like he's saying, have you come? Are you going to help me in first? And then Jesus just looks at him and says this, stand up, take up your mat and walk. And he does. Totally, absolutely restored. A great and a wondrous miracle. Now when John selected the miracles that he records, he selected seven, which he called great signs. And he built around each one of them a teaching so we would understand what the significance of it was. This is the third of the great sign miracles of the Gospel of John. So it gives quite a bit of detail about how Jesus then interacted with the Pharisees because they were mad as snakes, <laughs> which they kind of were. And they came storming up to him and said, Hey, you've just healed somebody on the Sabbath. That's work, China. We have 70 little rules which say that this is what work constitutes. Const healing is one of the 17 that you can't do. Can you just imagine that? It's true. So he enters into this protracted dialogue with them. And during the course of this, he gives us some very, very interesting and important information. You see, the second thing that he did, which really infuriated the Pharisees, was in the course of his talking with them, he claimed the authority of God. And he said that he, in fact, was the Son of God. Wow, he had just made himself equal with God. Blasphemy! Not only was he breaking the Sabbath laws, but he was calling himself equal to God. So they were really upset with him. And he divulged the following information. He connected his own baptism, which probably occurred about a year before this scene. He connected it to what he was doing here at the pool of Bethesda. He connected it with the day of Pentecost. He said to them, if you don't believe me when I tell you who I am, why don't you believe John the Baptist? You guys called for him. You quizzed him. You asked him. He gave to He told you who I am. Why don't you believe him? The great prophet, John. And if that's not good enough for you, why don't you believe the words of the Father himself? For God the Father has attested to who I am. Now, when did those two testimonies take place? When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, just a little walk actually from Jerusalem because it was the top end of the Jordan River. And when Jesus went to be baptized by John, John not only said, you know, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, but John said the following. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 3. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then the account goes on in Matthew. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love with him. I am well pleased. So now a year later, he's saying to the Pharisees, If you don't believe me, don't you believe what John said? If you don't believe him, believe what you heard the Father saying from heaven itself. I am the Son of God. He connected what he was doing on that Feast of Pentecost with his own baptism about a year before. John baptized with water, but he said that Jesus would baptize not with water, 
but with fire and with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus spoke about that himself. He told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem, and he said to them this, John baptized with water. See, he's connecting back to John. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then he ascended into heaven. And ten days later, the Holy Spirit came like a great rushing wind and with fire. Fire fell. Not these, I can't see these like these little candle lights in a blip coming onto the heads like we see in the paintings. No. The Holy Spirit came with a rushing wind and with great power and with fire from heaven and filled them with such an anointing that they were burning up with enthusiasm, with joy, and with overflowing power. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, the Holy Spirit came down like a dove and filled him with the power of heaven to an unimaginable extent. It says that Jesus was filled without measure with the power of the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus was taken and led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested. An interesting observation, by the way, is those three tests that occurred in the wilderness were specifically designed to test whether or not he would act in his divinity or whether he would be dependent on the Holy Spirit for his years on earth. They chose to be dependent. And he came out of the wilderness. And it says these words, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Jesus' glorious, powerful, miracle healing, deliverance, wondrous miracles, wondrous ministry, started as he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe there's reasonable grounds here, although it is speculative, to connect his baptism with what was taking place on that day of Pentecost and with what then took place a couple of years later in Jerusalem, the, the baptism of his, of his disciples. It's speculative, but I think it's reasonable. But I tell you what's certain, what's beyond all speculation, is that Jesus' ministry started with a mighty empowerment. The evidence is abundantly clear. And the ministry of the church started with a mighty infilling of the same Holy Spirit. And that is equally abundantly clear in scriptures. 120 frightened disciples locked in an upper room because they were scared that the Jewish rabbis were going to come and catch them. But full of hope, full of expectation, and full of faith. Because Jesus had said, you will receive power from a high weight. They didn't know when it was going to happen. Maybe they could have put two and two together and thought, Pentecost is a good time for that. <laughs> because on the day of Pentecost, that's exactly what did happen. And the church was born. And it drew its first breath. And like every baby, when it draws its first breath, what does it do? It cries out and gets its lungs going. Well, the church did exactly that. They drew a mighty breath of the Holy Spirit and rushed into the streets, speaking in tongues and proclaiming the glory and the wonder of Almighty God. <laughs> On that great and wonderful day that we celebrate, every year that we celebrate next week, next Sunday, the new body of Christ was born on planet Earth. A body empowered by the same Holy Spirit that empowered Jesus for ministry. A continuation of His ministry. And I'm going to repeat this a couple of times because it's so important. The church is the continuation of the ministry of Jesus on Earth. And it is the ongoing place of His presence in the world. Okay. Okay. Assuming, as I do believe, that Jesus' public ministry started at his baptism on the day of Pentecost as he was on his way to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. When do you think it ended? When did Jesus' ministry on earth end? 
at the cross? No, of course not, because guess what? On the third day he rose again. And for 40 days he appeared to his, his disciples and taught them concerning the kingdom of God. And he appeared to over 500 people. Did it end on the day that he ascended back into heaven? No. Because 10 days later, what he had promised came true. And the church of the living God, the body of Christ. Why do you think it's called the body of Christ? Because the new body, his embodiment on earth, came into being, was birthed on that glorious and wonderful, wonderful day. And it hasn't ended. Because we, the body of Christ, continue to be the presence and the presenter of the Lord Jesus Christ on this planet. And we will continue to do so until he comes again physically in glory. The day of Pentecost should be really, really important for all of us as Christians. Let me give you three reasons. One, it's the birthday of the church. And I did say I was going to repeat it, so I'll say it. The ongoing representation of Jesus on this planet, in our world. And here's the good news. Everyone who is born again, as you heard John O preach last Sunday, everyone who is born again of the Spirit is a member of that body. We are part of this glorious body. This little church is like a little fractional outcropping of this body, but it's across the face of the earth. And it's gone on for 2,000 years, generation after generation. And we are part of that. We are baptized into that when we are born again of the Spirit. Second good reason. When God the Holy Spirit took up residence in the church on the day of Pentecost. When Jesus walked this earth, God was present in human form and walked among the people of this planet. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and took up His residence in this new body of Christ, the church. And He walks among the people of this world in and through the church. <coughs> what a wonder to be part of that. What a privilege. What a responsibility. So the third important point is that we, like Jesus, and like those very first disciples, we need to be empowered from on high just as they were, if we are to be the effective, glorious body of Christ on earth. Being born again is not an optional extra. It's not the invention of the happy clappies. It's fundamental to our Christian life. Being filled with the Spirit is equally not optional. It is not a Pentecostal Invention. It's an absolute necessity. For, guys, I hate to tell you this, but without that, we the church would be nothing better than a religious club or some kind of a biblical school or some kind of a social works institution. Pitiful. In truth, we will be no better off than that man, lame and hopeless for 38 years. Unable to stand, with no hope and no future and no power and no joy. It's not optional. So come to church next Sunday. Those of you who can't come, if you're watching on TV, then come and sit before your television set prepared. Prepare yourself during this week. What an excitement. You, you, as a preacher, I experience what every one of us should be experiencing every week. You know, in the week that leads up to when I need to preach, I encounter God in such powerful and wonderful ways. Because my heart is open. I'm saying, Lord, what are you saying in your word? What must your people know? What must I know? What do I, how do I need to respond? 
If only, if only you too would prepare your hearts and spirits before the church service. And then come with tremendous expectation. It's the day of Pentecost. It's the birthday of the church. It's the day we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit into the church and into our lives. A great and wonderful day. Come and expect great things. Expect Him to talk to us. Expect Him to minister to us. Yes, I know every Sunday should be like Pentecost Sunday. Hey, every day of the week should be like Pentecost Sunday. But God gave those feasts for a reason. It's so that at least once a year we will remember and we'll respond and we'll take with breathless seriousness and joy the wonder of the Holy Spirit in and through His church. Empowered by Him, we can then go out into the world to be the standard bearers, the Christians, the bearers of Christ, the holders of light, the flame of the Holy Spirit burning bright in our hands, in our hearts, and in our eyes. Part of the body of Christ. Let me pray with you. And Father, we are a privileged people. Oh, that we were given the grace to come to know you and to be born again of your Spirit and to be able to call ourselves Christians, Christed ones, followers of Jesus, the Lord and the creator of all things. And Lord, what a privilege that you have promised that any one of us, your born-again children, who asks you, you will give the Spirit. You've said it so many times. Lord Jesus, you preach this so clearly. I don't know why we can't see it. All we need to do is to cry out and say, Father, without the Spirit, we are lame. Come, Holy Spirit. Glorify Jesus in and through us as you empower us to be his light bearers in this world. Please, Holy Spirit, work with, work with us during this week. Reveal Jesus to us. Fill us with a sense of urgency. Fill us with a sense of expectation, anticipation, and a building joy. Draw us into your presence and fill us with your spirit. I really do ask this in Jesus' name, the only name. Amen.